Countdown presented by BSC Investors Protection Fund. Manoj Pradhan, global economist at Morgan Stanley, is joining in from their conference itself. Manoj, thanks for taking the time out to talk to us today. Let, let, let's start off by getting a sense as far as the emerging okay. markets are concerned and how the scenario is looking like. India specifically has got its own bunch of positiveness that we've actually picked up in the last what month or so with the election coming to a close and you're getting a strong mandate at the center. The question here is, uh, Mr. Pradhan, how does India actually stack up com uh, compared to the other emerging markets right now? Uh, there is a bit of differentiation, but let's take the story back a little bit more. If you go back to last yes, summer, uh, India was part of a set of countries that had funding issues uh, along with Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, um, uh, um, and uh, Indonesia. India was also part of a set of countries um, that were not looked upon favorably by markets. What happened in the second half of last year is that India and Indonesia both decided to tackle uh, their problems head on. Uh, if you remember, the Fed decided not to taper in September, and that created a, quite a reprieve for emerging markets. Not everyone took advantage of it. As a result, by December itself, uh, uh, we in Morgan Stanley had already started becoming uh, selectively positive on what uh, things were happening out of India. That story obviously went much further uh, given the election outcome and, uh, uh, and, and, and how things stack up from here, given uh, a new person uh, at the helm of the RBI, a new person in the administration, um, and a clean start. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that India is not the only emerging market rallying now. Uh, bond, uh, bond yields in the U.S. are low. Bond volatility is extremely low. And that has set into motion what we call the carry trade. Uh, it's the search for yield. And along with India, Turkey, South Africa, Brazil have all done extremely well. There is diversification here because the, the content of the story for India is much better understood. Uh, the election outcome, uh, the scope for trend growth going higher is at stark contrast with other countries uh, that are simply a high interest rate play. And I think that story will continue to differentiate itself over time. Right. Manoj, let's also, you know, you mentioned a whole basket of those emerging markets. So what about China? That's the one we're also interested in because we're now, of course, starting to see uh, some, you know, data coming out that's indicating that growth might be returning in China. But we've also got calls coming and talking about India being the next China, perhaps, uh, at some point in the, in the, in towards the latter half of this decade. What's your call there when you compare these two markets? Um, it's, it's, it's a tough comparison, particularly for a short skit. But let me start with China itself. The reason you don't club China in with the other countries I spoke about earlier is because they're a closed capital account economy. They're not dependent on what happens uh, as far as U.S. interest rates are concerned. Yes, they receive capital flows, but keep in mind that they have a financial firewall. Um, the capital flows into China are blocked, which allows the domestic economy of China to operate almost independently. What we worry about coming out of China is whether the slowdown, which has already been happening for a while now, is going to be a sharp one or is going to be a slow one. Um, and I think this, the story in China is, is less well understood. I'll spend a minute just talking about it. Um, I think the story on China is, is understood to be one where, you know, after a five years or a decade, China will move to a consumption-led model of growth with 6% interest. In my opinion, that's unlikely to happen. Either you will get robust growth of 6%, which is investment-led, or if you move to consumption-led growth, then it's going to be significantly lower than this broad 6% range that people have in mind. Regardless, I think what that portends for countries that are commodity importers is reasonably positive news because China accumulated capital so incredibly quickly for its infrastructure, for its manufacturing, that it, it became the marginal buyer of hard commodities. Now, if you're a Brazil or you're in Indonesia, uh, that's, that's a difficult situation because you're exporting iron ore um, and energy to China, and that's, that's difficult news. But if you're a Turkey or a India, things don't actually look that bad. Uh, only if the slowdown is very sharp, in fears of a hard landing actually do materialize, then you've got a problem on your hands. Um, as to your last two questions, is growth stabilizing? Yes, growth is reasonably stable. Policymakers have come out and said that they want to, to support growth. The PBOC has been injecting liquidity into the system. There's been a lot of resistance because China is going through a structural change. Funding conditions on the ground have not improved, and that's what they're trying to address. And finally, I think, I think we should stay away from comparisons about whether India becomes a new China. That, kind, that should not be our focus at all. Uh, at this point in time, the focus in India just needs to be on adjusting its imbalances, making sure that you create a conducive environment for investment growth, and that means having a reasonable and responsible monetary policy which keeps real interest rates high. It does not encourage capital misallocation. 
if, your, if your real interest rates are zero, almost any business is profitable, and then you can grow as fast as you want. But that typically misallocates capital. If your real interest rates rise, the threshold for investment rises, and then profitable investments are generally the ones that receive capital. So I, I think India's trend growth is going to rise. China's trend growth is going to fall. You see a convergence. This need not be a good or a bad thing. They're just different economies growing in two different ways. But India's low starting point certainly helps. Um, and, and for the moment, it looks like a good story. You know, since we're talking about the macros and the outlook as well, we, we've been tracking the kind of commentary that we just picked up, uh, Manoj, from the RBI policy itself. Let, give us your thoughts in terms of some of the key takeaways and the indication that it's actually throwing up right now. Well, look, India's, India's problems are not unique. Um, India is part of a set of economies which share their problems. If you look at Turkey, if you look at South Africa, all of them opened up a current account because their savings fell fast and they fell faster than investment. The same story happened in India. India's investment fell because of very poor sentiment. Uh, all those causes are very well known. And the policy response, the fiscal policy response, the monetary policy response was to encourage consumption. But the flip side of that coin is always to reduce savings. So as savings fell faster than investment, you opened up a current account deficit. Now, India has been very lucky, very lucky that gold has been a large part of that current account. Gold is an inflation hedge. Uh, when you ban gold imports, you're telling Indian households that you cannot hedge yourself against inflation. And that's financial depression which is the only way the current account has come to sub 1% without really damaging the domestic economy. So we should consider ourselves very lucky in this, but it also means that a lot of fundamental work needs to be done, and that's where the RBI comes in. I think the, 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 the new governor and the RBI are committed to higher real interest rates. They understand that this is meaningful not just for protecting savings, but also for bringing in the right kind of investment and for a stable environment. If your trend growth is going to be 6%, you cannot have real interest rates at zero. That gap is just too big, and it will create all kinds of capital misallocation. I think, I think the RBI remains on track to deliver high real interest rates. Um, and when I say high, we don't mean exorbitantly high, but at least higher than they've been for the last few years. We've been talking, of course, uh, you know, about uh, the likely uh, growth scenario for India going ahead. The next key trigger point, of course, coming up is the budget. Uh, I know you may not want to go into very specific detail, but essentially, what are the kind of key uh, reform measures or the key um, boosters to growth that you feel are possible and that you'd like to see from the government in the near term? Yeah, you, you're quite right. Rather than go into details, let me tell you what general things are being looked upon as possible triggers for going in. I think the first story is the macro environment, which we've already talked about, so I won't spend any time on that. You do need an environment in which inflation has come down. Real rates are reflecting the trend growth in the economy. Um, the second thing that is a critical factor with this new administration coming in is the kickstarting of, of investment. Um, and that investment story collapsed, as we all know, primarily because of sentiment. Um, the sentiment from the financial crisis, from a lot of the corruption scandals that came up at the time, really gave no one any incentive to take on uh, a, a fallen and broken supply chain um, and very low investment uh, sentiment in the economy. That needs to be changed. And along with that changing, I think what we do need to see, not just from the budget, but also from a set of uh, initiatives that the new administration takes, is to bring online vital distribution and production links. So you need distribution channels that connect um, different manufacturing parts of the economy or different services parts of the economy. Uh, energy is going to be an absolutely critical part of the story, which they have to get right. Now, keep in mind, unlike a lot of other emerging market economies, India's per capita GDP level is low enough that a lot of the simple things will make a large difference. But that's the number one concern that international investors have, is that the infrastructure is simply not yet ready to pick up uh, the kind of pace that the Indian economy wants to generate. And as long as the focus remains on that, something that the administration has been very successful on at the state level, as long as that has brought onto a, a, a national scene in some way, um, I think the process will be seen to be remaining uh, very well underway. Manoj, let's try and get some estimates uh, as well as far as growth outlook is concerned. What are you, what are you working with for, let's say, an FI15 basis? Where do you see the GDP numbers panning out? And also, if you're working anything on the inflation? Um, yes, so I'll, I'll give you a rough sketch of what sure. our India economics team and Chetanaya, our Indian economist, is looking for. They're not baking in a significant pickup right now through reforms. Okay. Uh, there is a cyclical tranche, there is a globalization story, but what we're expecting is, is within a couple of years, we are hoping that uh, the base case will be something like 6.8% growth. 
which is very, very, very good, uh, certainly given the, the very low growth environment we've had for a while. On the inflation side, also, we're looking for improvements uh, within, within two years. We're hoping that inflation does finally move towards the top end of the RBI's comfort zone. So we're looking for a much more benign story where the, the, the growth picture is picking up, the inflation picture is turning down. And with, with a reasonably steady monetary policy, that also brings into alignment GDP growth and real interest rates as we go along. But, but I would caution us, uh, not just for India, but for almost every part of the world to stop paying that much attention to GDP growth. This is not the critical part of the story. The critical part of the story is whether the sectors of GDP growth, namely investment for India, manufacturing for India, exports for India, these are the things that are picking up. If your GDP growth comes to 6.8%, but it's coming from credit growth that goes into consumption, uh, not likely, we think, but suppose that is a scenario that unfolds. I don't think this is a positive scenario at all. It's a very similar story for the U.S. where a consumption binge is not going to help you. If it's an investment capex story that works out, then GDP growth is giving us the right story. Fair, fair enough. Point taken there. And Manoj, you, know, you started off the conversation by actually mentioning that somewhere in the second half of calendar year 2013, we saw some changes take place with the Indian economy and one of the key factors that reflected that was the kind of strength that we started seeing in the currency itself. The rupee currently hovering around what 59.32. We've come a long way from those, uh, you know, those short-term levels of 68, 69 where it had actually gone down to. The point is, what, what's the range? What are you working with? What are the expectations when we talk about the rupee? Um, okay, the, this is actually a question more for our strategy team, but I'll give you the macro fundamentals behind sure. it. And there are two points to be made here. First is, the rupee doesn't really help India that much. There are a set of countries, there's Russia, there's Brazil, there's Indonesia. These countries have what we call a Dutch disease problem. And in a Dutch disease problem, because of commodity prices going high at some point in time, your exchange rate appreciates, wages go up, so your real exchange rate, as we call it, appreciates. And a solution for that kind of problem is for your rupee to be weak. India doesn't have that issue. India's problem was never that you got a terms of trade shock. India's problem was that your real interest rates were too low. So the main equilibrating factor, again, to harp on about it is the real interest rate, not the exchange rate. Now, having said that, what's the outlook for the rupee from a fundamental point of view? Well, from the fundamental point of view, if your real interest rate is going to rise, um, this provides a more benign environment as far as the currency and bonds are concerned. And the second thing is, if you're looking at a reform-led process, if you're last starting from a very weak starting point of Indian growth into which you're going to add investment, you're going to add capex, then in a reform story, almost every asset class tends to do well. The flows come in, uh, not, not just from portfolio flows for investment, but also from FDI when the, uh, when the picture looks a little bit better. Uh, bonds tend to do well. Uh, equities pick up not because of real interest rates rising. That's always difficult. But because you see the, the scope for earnings improve because growth improves. So the picture if the reforms process goes through as we fully expect it would, the, the picture for the currency actually is a, is a fairly decent one. Right. Manoj, um, just before we let you go, now the ECB meet is coming up and this time around there are hopes that we'll see some, uh, some kind of signals or decisions coming in from them in terms of stimulus. Um, just talk us through if you are also anticipating anything and really, you know, what, uh, what the impact of... Uh, a slowdown in growth or, or you know, worries about growth uh, in the region could also mean for emerging markets like India. Right. Um, well, th there's, there's, there's a few things here to be dealt with, right? First, I think you know, you, you, we need to take into account that um, President Draghi's speech uh, back uh, when he said it'll, we'll do whatever it takes uh, really had an absolutely huge impact on, on the markets. Real interest rates fell below GDP growth, and that's really what revitalized uh, something that looked like an incredibly hard situation. Uh, when, when the ECB does meet, we are expecting action, but we are not expecting QE. I think that hurdle is, is a very high one to cross. We are looking at a depot rate cut, which will take the deposit rate into negative territory. Um, this will be a first for the ECB and first for a large developed market central bank to do. It's been done before with some of the smaller central banks. This is stopping short of QE, but, but keep in mind that you know what they've done extremely well has been speaking dovishly and keeping open a promise of doing something if they need to. And this will be in line with what they're doing. Uh, they may not necessarily have the biggest uh, um, actions at this point in time, but I think the open-ended nature and the willingness of the, uh, of the ECB to engage uh, will be enough to keep investors at bay. 
If they do have a, a large open-ended QE program, it's obviously good for emerging markets. It helps uh, uh, countries that fund themselves in euros. Those are mostly the Central and Eastern European countries, not so much Asian economies or Latin American economies. But do keep in mind that you should not be looking at the ECB's decision in isolation. Because while the ECB sets about easing policy in order to get rid of deflation worries, on the other hand, we are seeing nascent signs of U.S. economic growth coming back uh, after that really unimpressive first quarter that they had. Uh, U.S. growth in the last week has certainly given much better signals. Bond deals are up. So on the one hand, the ECB's signal could be to push uh, interest rates lower. The U.S. will be pushing interest rates higher. It's the interplay between the two that we have to think about, and I would pay more attention to the U.S. Countdown, presented by BSC, Investors Protection Fund.